<laughs> Hello, everybody. Is the mic on? Are we good? Hello, everyone. My speaking notes say I should bid you good afternoon, but given that we've already offered you Prosecco, I think perhaps I'll bid you good evening because it makes me feel better even if not you. It's, it's a real pleasure to have you with us uh, for the central event of our celebratory year. Um, and if you weren't already aware, you certainly will be by now, that, that, that this year marks our 25th anniversary as the UK's independent quality body. Throughout the year, we're taking this opportunity to hold a series of conversations with higher education experts from across the UK and around the world. These conversations are designed to be a wide-ranging and hopefully challenging exploration of quality in different contexts from a range of perspectives. So our starting point is the central question, what does quality really mean in practice in a complex and rapidly changing sector? It's an important time as our sector emerges from the pandemic-induced disruption and looks at the challenges ahead for everyone in higher education, here in the UK and internationally. Tonight, our excellent panel will unpack what quality means for them as they debate our motion, which Simon will introduce in a moment. Before that, though, I'd just like to say a few thank yous. We're really lucky to have a fantastic venue in Senate House, which itself is celebrating 90 years since construction began. Many thanks indeed to the University of London for hosting us here today. And many thanks too to our sponsor, Explorance, which helps universities around the world to improve teaching and learning through the way they capture, analyse and respond to student feedback. Explorance specialises in module evaluation, course evaluation and other student voice surveys, providing valuable data and insight to help institutions make informed decisions to support teaching and learning enhancement. In the UK alone, Explorance works with many universities from Brighton to Bristol and Sheffield to Strathclyde. They publish helpful sector insight reports and host regular community events for their customers and all this work is supportive of our mission to improve the quality of UK higher education wherever it's delivered across the UK and around the world. So on behalf of QAA, thank you especially to you for joining our conversation about quality. I hope you enjoy the debate and please do stay for our celebration at the end of the, uh, the event. And I'll now hand over to QAA's chair, Simon Gaskell. Thank you very much, Vicky, and may I add my, my welcome to you all um, to this debate. If any of you are feeling cold, by the way, you'll find the radiators at the back of the room are on full belt, so um, <laughs> feel free to move backwards if you're feeling chilly. Um, I think we have a, 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 the prospect of a stimulating debate now, um, or it is in the eye of the beholder. This is not, of course, a, a, um, a traditional for or against um, type of debate. Um, I'm assuming that no one would wish to argue against the importance of, of, of quality. But we will hope to get a number of perspectives. We will get a number of perspectives on what quality means, whether we're talking about quality control, quality assurance, or, or quality enhancement. And there are, of course, distinct differences between those, as, as Vicky's recent um, paper published by Heppy has uh, made, made clear. What I would suggest, however, that there is a stage that we must always keep in mind, and that is uh, developing the ability to explain succinctly what quality means, if you like, beyond the condescenti. Because unless we can explain to government or to students or to the wider public what we mean by quality and how to recognise it, then there's a real danger that so others will try to suggest um, parameters for the measurement of, of quality which are chosen simply because they're easily measurable but are in fact uh, at best imperfect prox proxies for what we're really trying to measure and understand. So we'll have a very fully developed debate of the different perspectives on, on quality, uh, but let's keep in mind that if, um, for example, the university's minister were here and said, what do you mean by quality? She would not be impressed by our saying, that's, that's a really interesting question, let's debate it for the next hour and a half. <laughs> so let's bear in mind the, the need to express our ideas uh, in due course in a, in a concise way. 
But that will be informed by these various perspectives. I'm delighted we have such a, a strong panel uh, with us. We have, I should say, all of whom are, are speaking in a personal capacity, but we have uh, Hilary Giebiababio from the NUS. She is the Vice President for Higher Education for, what, another week, is it, um, Hilary? Three days. Three, Three days, days. <laughs> okay. So we are enormously privileged to be catching her before she, of course, disappears without trace. Um, <laughs> our second speaker is Maureen McLaughlin from um, Northumbria University. She is Academic Registrar and Director of Student, Library and Academic Services, which sounds... Um, Thrilling. Quite a responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> Um, our first speaker will be Professor John Silkins, who is Deputy Principal for Learning and Teaching at Terrett Watt University. Uh, then we have Chris Millwood, uh, now Professor of Practice in Education Policy, University of Birmingham. But many of you will recognise Chris through his work with, with Hefke and then um, OFS. We were to have had with us Jamie Arrowsmith uh, from UUK International. Unfortunately, Jamie has tested positive for COVID and so is not able to join us, although I think Jamie may be viewing this online. Um, if so, Jamie, we wish you well and hope that you are, um, if not um, virus-free, then largely symptom-free. So each um, of those uh, four speakers now will speak for five minutes or as short a shorter time as I can <laughs> strain them to. Um, and then we will open that for discussion, both from the floor uh, and from, uh, for any uh, questions submitted online. We do have also a couple of questions uh, submitted in advance, which we can turn to if we have time. But we'll develop the discussion based on what we hear in the next uh, uh, 20 to 30 minutes. So could we begin? Uh, we're all going to stay seated um, to make sure we're relatively informal, but can I start, Hilary, by turning to you for your perspective, which of course is based on the, the students' viewpoint. You'd Hilary. hope so. Um, I could speak from my own perspective and get away with it. Um, <laughs> but. Um, First of all, thank you to the QAA for inviting me for my last ever event, actually, um, as VPHE. And I think this is a very important area that I've probably spent most of my two years going on about <laughs> somewhere, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, um, sometimes on Wonky if they let me. Um, but, you know, when I was thinking about what to speak to in terms of quality being in the eye of the beholder, I did think at first I would be like students and get off the stage, go home and have a gin. But I actually thought, let me give you a proper explanation of what I mean. When I think about quality, I think it's best described, and this is probably not simple, as a kaleidoscope. And I think about a kaleidoscope as an interchangeable, moving structure that, you know, when you step back, it looks a, like a very pretty picture. And if it's all working well, it's a very pretty picture of things that are going well and running smoothly. But behind each component are um, interrelating things that contribute to making the whole thing work. Um, and so for students, this comes up in what is taught in the curriculum, the things that you hear them you know, speak about in their lecture theatres, but it also is about their ability to connect with peers, lecturers, the wider world, the sector, um, activities beyond the educational experience that make higher education or education in any form at any level enjoyable, enriching and an experience worth going through. It is, about putting a, a, it is about putting together a seamless infrastructure that allows students to never question whether it's good enough, but instead, what can make it better? So I've got a few things that I think really illuminate this picture about what quality is. So recently, we've been hearing a lot about things being done in the name of students' best interests. And um, this is a term that has been banded around sometimes by me, but mostly um, by you folks in the sector and, and people beyond. Um, I think this is a very interesting um, one because behind the jargon, the acronyms, the, the different things that people have used to talk about quality, a simple truth stands true that at the heart of education, quality is maintained as far as, it, as far as it is dedicated to the people it looks to benefit most, students. Where we put students first in the business of quality, we look to assess and review our standard practice, but even more we innovate and we develop based on more than just baselines, but, and we listen closely on an act on the cause for a different type of learning, a flexibility in teaching modes and environment, more investment and integration of non-academic activity into the academic space and the ability to have recognition for the importance of disciplines that have been long dis been discredited and underfunded. 
we then move on to assurance. You can tell I'm a very enhancement facing person, like that's my thing. Um, but assurance, of course, is very important. It is also important that when we es express things about quality, we do not equate quality to being about value for money. And God knows I spent a lot of time fighting people, maybe in this room, about value for money not being what quality is about, but actually the value of quality being what we should focus on. We best serve students when this is seen as not the reductive sign of pound signs and getting your money's worth, but instead the outcomes of quality that come through in enriching ways for students. Great quality outcomes are not solely found in salaries and in the big flashy jobs that people expect students to get, but instead they're found in the growing engagement of students in academia, students that are entering and re-entering education at all levels in all forms, um, students making massive strides to change the academic canon, you know, decolonization, I couldn't leave without saying that, so I said it, tick. Um, <laughs> and making sure that our education system continues to be a place that all students see as a flexible place for them to continue to engage with and thrive in. For students, this means that working to make higher education more agile and organic in its growing um, makes it a better, more inclusive and enriching space. Finally, realisation. Quality being about the whole university experience is central for students. It's not just about the sort of learning outcomes you see on course outlines. It's not about making sure students get into the exam hall and get out with a decent grade. Many students are told that higher education is about getting them a, a degree that gets them a job. And whilst that's true, it's also about students being able to come into higher education and realise what they're most passionate about. It's about making them see that they can make a real change in the world, no matter who they are, where they've come from, or what they think or feel. Quality is also about providing the resource, the variety and the environment for imagination that creates environments where students can really enjoy high quality delivered in a high quality way. It is because of this that we must recognise that quality is properly done by people who are passionate, dedicated and well-intentioned for the good of students. It is through that that we recognise that quality is about how we protect education being about enrichment, about development, about curiosity and most importantly about a journey that students take with their peers, their institutions, the sector even, to carve out the things they want to bring to the world and to their communities. Therefore, we must not forget that although we all behold quality from our own angles and perspectives, for students, they behold quality in their journeys, stories and experiences of how they engage with their time in education. And that is the lens upon what, which we must view quality from the end. Thank you, Hilary, and that, that was indeed exactly five minutes, so I'm, I'm, I'm enormously impressed. Well done. Um, oh. I'm impressed also. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> uh, I'm impressed also by some really key points that I think came there, and you will each have taken some key points for that, but the ones that stood out for me are, first of all, your, your characterization uh, of quality from the student point of view as, as very much a multidimensional topic. Yeah. Um, as you emphasise yourself, enhancement is, is, is critical to the point where I, I get the impression you don't want to consider quality, unless you're embracing um, the enhancement uh, concept as well. You reminded us emphatically that, that um, quality is not the same as value for money, and, and I certainly agree with you in that. Um, a very interesting point I thought you brought out was that um, value to some extent is reflected by students' continuing commitment to education, yeah. and that I think is a particularly interesting concept in, in the, um, uh, from the perspective of, of lifelong learning, for example. So that, that's uh, something we might want to develop in discussion. And finally, I, I liked your, 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 your idea that quality actually protects education. Uh, and we should embrace that concept as a sector, I think. You will each have taken um, different points from, from Hillary's um, comments. But let's for now move on to Maureen. Hello. To give your perspective based on... Uh, an institutional perspective, and I don't think that's an intended in a pejorative sense. Um, but, um, <laughs> well, your, your perspective. We please. shall see. Um, Hilary, I think I may have, I could have done with the gin that you rejected. Um, and <laughs> if this was Twitter, I'd just have a little arrow saying what Hilary said. <laughs> um, but um, 
I guess if quality really is in the eye of the beholder, who or what is that beholder? And I guess it's, can there ever really be one view of it? Um, I was thinking about Henry Ford, not that I um, have such an exciting life, that that's the only thing I can think about, but quali Henry Ford once said, quality means doing it right when no one is looking. Um, probably not the best eye advice you might get if you're driving one of his cars. <laughs> and you're an incautious driver like myself, but um, it's often the gap between what you say and what you actually do, I think. Um, and I'm going to try and keep to five minutes. Um, and again, another literary quote, because I'm feeling very literary heavy today. If I can't overwhelm you with the quality of my words, I certainly am going to overwhelm you with the quantity. Um, <laughs> and just pray that, the, just thank the Lord that we, we weren't asked to do this with PowerPoint, um, my favourite tool of death and torture. So um, looking at this wicked problem um, from an institutional perspective, that actually presents me with a challenge. Um, I've worked at nine institutions um, in the UK and overseas, and I also spent a considerable amount of time working at this fine establishment known as the QAA, in which I led over 40 reviewers of higher education providers in the UK and overseas. And for those of you who come from those um, particular institutions, deep apologies um, <laughs> if I ate all the sandwiches, which I undoubtedly did. Um, and it, I think it's fair to say in each of those particular environments, quality manifested itself in a number of different ways. Um, it was, I guess, you, you couldn't easily transport something that worked well in one institution and necessarily just put it down and see it working well in another. Um, and I think just to pick up on you, Hilary, and I think you've been reading my notes, I was going to say <laughs> my perspective is less of a single lens and certainly more of a kaleidoscopic view mm -hmm. of that experience. When I was reflecting on quality, I kept thinking of things like exception and perfection and fitness for purpose. And yes, unfortunately, value for money did swim inevitably into view and transformation, actually. All of those terms can offer very different, I guess, paradigms from which one could view what quality is and what it means in higher education. And I know there was a, a raft of white papers that suggested the view that we should look at fitness for purpose, and that purpose being meeting the needs of students and employers as customers, where quality becomes a means for customer satisfaction and achieving better value for money and employment prospects of those students. That indeed poses a challenge because it does render quality very individual and very subjective. And as we know um, from the experience of customers, those expectations can vary wildly. And the purpose is often very much associated with the government's political ambitions of changing the way that we work as institutions in a more competitive and economical way, but also pos poses us some challenges in limiting, inhibiting some of that um, diversity that we want to see operating in the learning and teaching environment. And that's incredibly more difficult to do when you're in a compliance-driven culture. And it really does drive a gap, I think, between understanding around quality, between an academic's and the student's understandings of quality, and that consumer culture that focuses on need, necessarily, and sometimes to the detriment of actually the joy of learning. And I think that is a, a bit of an issue and a challenge that continues for us. And I think that pragmatic approach of fitness for purpose, um, in terms of higher education, can be at odds with the more socially positive views of HE and it can overlook the approach that quality is more than just the management of quality, and it has greater benefits when it's more people orientated and has an academic community. And when I use that term, I mean students and academic staff and professional services staff, of which I am proud to be one, um, working together to tackle the, prom the problems that we recognise and that we believe we've got the skills to resolve. And an overemphasis, I guess, on quality management can often result in insecurity. I was chatting to Chris just before we started formally here about the differences between some of the institutions I've worked in. Um, some institutions, which I have to say, um, a letter would come in from the regulator and the VC would say to me, look at that, I don't even want to open it. <laughs> <laughs> and other VCs who were all over it because there was a certain fear about responding in a regulatory environment in some of those particular institutions. There is a wild variety out there um, and not that it's very difficult for us to admit that in public. And I think that sometimes 
leads to academics seeing themselves very detached from the world of quality, not seeing themselves as having a place within it or having any influence or shape over it. They see it sometimes as satisfying rules of quality evaluation, charges of ticking boxes, perhaps at the expense of making a real contribution to the improvement of learning and teaching. My favourite analogy, which I use way too often, is um, while you may not fatten a pig simply by weighing it, it is nevertheless helpful to know the weight gained or added. But as a quality practitioner for many years, I've also been equally interested in exploring with colleagues, with students and with reviewers, how was that weight gained? Are some parts too thin and others are flabbier? What factors contributed to this gain? What worked and what didn't? And was the pig satisfied at the end <laughs> of the day? <laughs> And then on to value for money. Um, I think the notion of value for money has certainly grown apace in recent years, and it does seek to draw that direct line between quality and expense, an economic exchange, if you will, assuming that customers are willing to pay for better quality. What pleases a customer more is superior quality for the same money or less money. And it's closely related to that notion of the student as a consumer and a customer with tuition fees. And that can drive that sort of concentration on grades, improve grades, improve employment prospects so that one can actually sit back and make that measurement. Um, and that sometimes can also lead to a suggestion that education is a process that happens to the student, that they're more passive, that they don't necessarily have an active part to play in that education journey. It's that old analogy of joining a gym. If you've bought the membership, why hasn't it made me fit? That is usually my refrain every New Year's Day. Um, <laughs> and we need to exercise that muscle, biological and neuro neurological, to see those benefits. We know from recent survey outcomes and emer emerging research that despite our not inconsiderable efforts to deliver good and engaging academic experiences over the pandemic, in that online blended arena. Our students tell us they prefer, they want, they expect a face-to-face -face experience. That's what they paid for and that's what they rightfully expect. But I think some of us might recognise this hasn't necessarily been reflected as heavily as it might have been. Our classrooms and our labs are still not um, crammed to the rafters. But what it does give me is some hope that the value of education in itself is a bit more than a transactional experience and an exchange of knowledge and information. And the, uh, the value of the offer of social interaction still being prized. Um, as a professional services leader, I just wanted to say my colleagues and I, we take our roles really seriously in recognising we are and should be part of that glue that helps to bind our academic communities of students and academics. And that means working in the quality arena productively with those stakeholders. And like quality, when things go well, perhaps it's because it's invisible and it's seamless. And that should extend to the way that we work with our partners as well. And it's the kind of network, I suppose, that um, and way of working. QAI has always strived, I think, to support amongst the academic community. And I just wanted to finish by talking about two examples of quality in operation in an institution. One is student-led teaching awards, and I had the great pleasure to be um, present at our Northumbria one but two weeks ago. Those awards were evidence-based, they were student-driven, they were a recognition of academics and support staff for the impact that they have on the student learning experience and their wider enjoyment of university life. It was a source of delight and pride and after many years of social distancing, also one of celebration. And I guess many studies indicate that recognition and reward within the academic community are important motivational forces for, academic, for our academics in sense of recognising their quality as academic um, professionals. We also um, launched, uh, it doesn't sound very sexy, but I promise you it really is, a new quality process within our institution <laughs> this year. <laughs> Continuous Programme Performance Review, CPPR, which I kept referring to as CPR, and boy, did <laughs> I need it. Um, and initially, that started out as a very heavily outcomes-based, data-driven new system of making my institution TEF-ready and Office for Student compliant. Um, it certainly led to huge improvements in the production of ever-colourful dashboards, but actually more seriously in our data analysis. And I would like to say that would be echoed in our data literacy, but unfortunately there's some, still a journey to go in that sense. And it was really good and helpful to us in identifying gaps and areas for further development and targeted attention across the academic portfolio. However, 
the how we've chosen to deliver it is slightly different. And we've chosen to implement it and breathe life into it by taking out what seemed to be a two-dimensional system out on a roadshow. So we held roadshows with departmental staff, student representatives and professional services colleagues to talk about those outcomes and have a frank discussion about what the outcomes were telling us, to have those debates about the findings, stimulate discussion about addressing the gaps, taking action, recognising where things have worked well and celebrating them and where they are appreciated by our students. And that's actually helped us fed into the development of our new education strategy and, I have to be honest, my own annual planning process because I listened to every complaint there was about inadequate support services and said, right, well, I need some money to improve those across the piece. But it was really, really helpful as a process and I think actually breathed life into that academic community. I mentioned data literacy before, and I have to be honest, I appreciate a well-crafted spreadsheet like any good nerd, but I find myself drawn to a narrative every time. What does it tell us about our students and our provision? How did we get here, and where are we planning to go? And I'd like to conclude, I suppose, just by saying quality is greater than the sum of its measurable par parts. And perhaps my own conclusions chime with the off-quoted view that it's never an accident but more the result of high intention, sincere effort, intelligent direction and skillful execution. And while the culture wars are still raging, I guess, in the sector, the quality wars may have continued unabated. And I think it's really time for us um, as members of the HE community to return to that fray. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maureen. Uh, again, a number of really interesting points. I, I, I liked your, your earlier comment that um, there's no single model for quality. Um, and indeed, we should celebrate and, and, and often do celebrate the diversity in the sector and, and the, therefore the diversity of ways of demonstrating quality. It does make life more difficult when one comes to definitions, but I think we shouldn't, um, we shouldn't expect to, or we shouldn't aim to restrict ourselves or restrict that diversity in, in the search for um, higher quality across the board. I also liked your characterization of, of quality as emphatically uh, people-oriented, both with respect to the, the students who are the beneficiaries of education, but also with respect to the academics who sometimes need greater engagement with, with consideration of, of, of quality issues. I also noted that you, at least implicitly, um, considered value for money to be a component that one needs to consider. Yeah. Um, and so you and Hillary may have a... <laughs> Uh, an embryonic One debate component, there. yes. Well, thank you for that. Let's move on then to, to uh, John Sorkins, who, who is going to bring us, a, I think, I hope, a very valuable perspective and remind us, um, not least, that we are part of a UK system here um, and that despite the different approaches that are taken across the four nations, uh, we each have much to learn from each other. Thanks, Simon, Simon for that. I found that I'm not able to read off my phone because my arms are too short. <laughs> <laughs> and I need a bigger font these days, so um, I'll, I'll, I'll have a piece of paper instead. When I completed my PhD back in 1993, which is um, before you were born, um, <laughs> a number of kind people wrote to me and sent me cards and letters and said, well done. And, but the one that gave me most pause for thought was a friend who was a school head, and he said to me, well, well done, but remember, the process is just as important as the outcome. So, at the time, I thought he was off his chump, but then, of course, <laughs> I, at the time, I thought it was all about learning to do research, the academic apprenticeship, um, the piece of paper, the outcome, the PhD itself, which would then open doors to new jobs. But as the years have passed, my perspective has changed. And I now frequently reach for the well-worn quip, higher education is a process masquerading as an outcome. And I want to suggest that's not a bad starting point when we are to consider how quality is perceived across the different nations that comprise the UK, as we all do, process and outcome. But the mix and the emphasis isn't the same. So do we have to trade off one against the other, or can we hold both of these things in creative tension with each other in order to have good outcomes for our students? 
So let me define my terms because um, Simon asked me to do that. And I'm going to do this by simply, um, um, I want to refer to um, Vicky Stott's uh, paper uh, that Simon had uh, referred to there. And uh, repeat back to you, Vicky, the words you used in that paper. <laughs> Academic <laughs> quality, you said, is a comprehensive term referring to how and how well higher education providers manage teaching and learning opportunities to help students progress and succeed whilst meeting the legitimate expectations of students, employers, government and society. So then, she then went on to outline how it could be considered on a spectrum from control at one end to enhancement at the other end, all underpinned by benchmarks and reference points. And I want to suggest that we can layer on top of that spectrum one that has outcomes at the control end and process at the enhancement end. And I want to suggest further that it's the um, relative weight given to either process or outcomes which can ex uh, explain in some part the different practices and regulations we work within within the different nations of the UK as the individual systems pull apart from each other. Now, let me just say a little bit more about the Scottish higher education system. We've worked since 2003 within a framework which has five interconnected and mutually supporting parts, which I won't list now, but let me instead <coughs> remind us that it was founded on the principle that the purpose of systems in higher education is to improve learning for our students. And it also emerged from and was a reaction to interventions that were compliance driven with a focus on the current state of play rather than how to make things better and improve things. So north, in the north, the enhancement process we have is not a once every five years checkup, if you like, like a ship sheep dip to rid the institution of unpleasant ticks and bugs. <laughs> it involves a continuous and ongoing interaction between regulators and regulatees. And whilst the outcomes of the process itself are very important in the Scottish system, the enhancement process is important too. And the risk that one has to keep an eye on in this system is, of course, that the process becomes the thing. So, down south, as I would say, <laughs> things don't quite look or run in the same way. And we certainly don't have to use phrases like fre uh, TEF ready and Office for Student Compliant either. <laughs> you can have those. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Process is there, but the focus, I think, is sharper in terms of the outcomes. And we have the market playing in in a much bigger way um, to which we'll hear perhaps a little bit more about from Chris later. You can shed the process itself and the cost of the process itself, but the risk is there that you lose sight of the bigger, pic of the bigger picture, if you like. Whereas if you make sure that process and outcomes are held side by side, you keep the central feature in the frame. And whilst you may reduce the risk, of capture of the regulator by the um, sector, you risk ending up in a world in which there is greater informational asymmetry. And then you require more data and you require more systems and more processes, dare I say, think TEF, to discover things which in other systems might be openly shared. So let me be clear, at each end of the spectrum there are issues 
and no system within the UK sits at one end. Okay, we all have that mix. But that, uh, the point I want to make, I think, is that in a time of reform and change across the UK, it's really important to listen and to learn from each other. And one last point. Um, why do we do this stuff? For those of us who are fortunate enough to be engaged in education at um, any level, we do well to recall that we're not playing some you know, um, zero-sum game in which one institution or one individual student wins because A another is going to lose out. That's not what this is in fact about. At the end of the day, it's all about our students and it's about their transformation and growth, which is why the students themselves should be the focus of the outcomes and the students themselves should be part of every process that we have. Thanks, Annie. Thank you. Thank you, thank you John. Again, a, a lot to, to ponder on there. I, I, I liked your, your quote, higher education as a process masquerading as an outcome. Mm. I wonder whether we might later on get into the discussion, which I think I would argue that if you get the process right, the outcomes will take care of themselves. And it reminded me that when I was in... in uh, former days when I was at uh, Queen Mary and was talking to prospective students at open days, I would say, don't come to Queen Mary because you think you'll get a better job at the end of it. You will, by the way, but that's not <laughs> the reason you should come. And don't come because you think you'll learn more at the end of it, which, by the way, you will, but come because you will be excited by the process of being here and the process of learning. And I wonder whether there's a lesson for quality there. If you get the quality right, whatever that means, and that's what we're debating, and outcomes will, will take care of themselves. So I... I we might come back to that uh, to, to discuss it, but having said all that, I also liked your characterization as, as um, outcomes essentially being uh, an enabler for quality control and, and, and process, getting the process right is, is what uh, enables you to achieve um, enhancement. And finally, the, the um, reminder that, that um, quality is not a zero-sum game. If we enhance quality for one student, then almost inevitably we're enhancing it for all. So thank you for those thoughts. Um, finally, then, Chris Millwood. Okay, thanks everyone, thanks colleagues for um, prompting some of what I'm going to say. Ah. Um, so, so I guess, you know, I've got to start with the, the definitional question. Uh, so I would start by saying we claim in the UK to have a high quality higher education system. So for me that means we must be able to say that our courses, our qualifications enable the best possible academic experience and outcomes from learning for students of all kinds and in all settings. So that's easy to say, but there's a question that flows from it about uh, who determines that and who drives it. And I think that's changed during the lifetime of the QAA. And it's changed uh, in terms of the relationship between hi higher education providers, universities and colleges, um, the state, the government, and there are different governments across the UK and the market, and we, we've already heard about the market framed in terms of students as empowered consumers and competing universities and colleges. So, so how has that played out during the 25 years of, of the QAA? I think many of my colleagues working in English universities think that universities have kind of ceded authority over quality to the state and then the state has imposed the market. And again, I'm talking from an English perspective here. I, I think it's more complicated than that. I think what you're actually seeing is the rise and the fall of the market and the empowerment of students as consumers within our system. And as ever, a lot of this has been about pragmatism and finances as much as it has been about ideology. So I'm going to share four quotes with you and we will give you our 25th anniversary chocolates if you can guess <laughs> who said them <laughs> and when they were said. So here's the first one. So government is giving a stronger focus to teaching reflected in a significant stream of resources. We will publish an annual comprehensive student survey, establish new national professional teaching standards and establish new centres of teaching excellence. Here's the second one. 
We want there to be a renewed focus on high quality teaching in universities, so we will empower prospective students by ensuring much better information on different courses. Here's a third one. Competition between providers in higher education, indeed in any market, incentivizes them to raise their game, offering consumers a greater choice of more innovative and better quality products and services. And then here's the last one. A defensive game when it comes to quality will not do. We have to be bold enough to identify where quality is slipping in our system and stamp out complacency. So that's a bit of a journey. And I think the first step in the journey is probably around the time of the setting of the QAA. And I think you can see the setting of the QAA as a kind of compromise between universities and the state. And the empowerment of students as consumers, or at least the, the framing of that within policy, I think follows progressively increases in English tuition fees. So in the mid-2000s, you have both the market and the state advancing forward. So you have information and rights for students, National Student Survey, Independent Adjudicator, but you also have public funding promoting excellence and professional standards. From 2010, of course, you have greater reliance on the market, the, you know, a lot of language around transparency for students on the content and outcomes from their courses with the intention that informs choices and also feedback and engagement with universities and colleges. You then have, as we've talked about, ready institutions becoming TEF ready, a teaching excellence framework from 2016 intended to provide clear and comparable, crucially comparable, quality grades, and of course, ultimately, the OFS, a market regulator described by the minister as a classic market regulator, providing confidence around a baseline and facilitating competition above it. So if you listen to that so far, I think you might well agree with the kind of narrative I started with at the start, which is, uh, to a certain extent, the rise of the market. But I do think that's changed during the last two years. I think the current government in England has concluded it can't rely on markets. And that's not just a higher education issue. So it can't rely on markets to deliver the promises of Brexit and levelling up. It couldn't rely on markets during the coronavirus pandemic. It's also, of course, concluded that student finance, advised by the ONS, is a very substantial cost to the state. So it's concerned about the size, the shape and the character of provision that might be flowing through from the interaction between student choice, expectations and feedback and competing providers. I think you can see that in some of the positioning around, for example, student number controls, national student survey, some of the language around inclusive education and assessment, and perhaps you can see it in the appetite for boots on the ground as well. So I think we're currently seeing less reliance on the market, less of the language around students as consumers. And I think that does take you back to the foundations of the QAA, because it does, for me, mean we do need to think about a different kind of settlement between universities and the state. Simon. Thanks very much, Chris. A, a, lo a lot to, um, to get our teeth into there. I, I think the... I'm not sure whether you are suggesting this or reflecting on uh, observations of others, but the idea of, of universities ceding responsibility for quality to the state. Um, if anyone holds that perception, then it seems to me the sector is well advised to, to, to argue against that and, and to, and to recognise the, um, the achievement and assurance of quality I is a shared objective between um, all involved, institutions, students, and, and, and government. So if there is such a perception, then that, that needs to be counted, I think. Very interesting comments about the market and, and the market as a driver for quality. I'm inclined personally to agree with you that um, the, the notion that all that was required to drive up quality was a real market um, was uh, always seemed a little bit naive and, and I'm encouraged by your analysis that that is, is perceived to be uh, naive now. But I think your focus on, on the drivers of quality is, was, was very timely and I think we will come back to some of those issues. What we're going to do now is to um, uh, open it up to questions um, from the floor and indeed the, some mechanism that Noreen will, um, uh, I think, have control of, of, of um, questions submitted online. We have a few advanced yeah. questions. I should 
warn the panel in advance. So what I thought we might do at the end is, is ask each of you to reflect on any changes or any insights, insights that you have picked up from the discussion, either from what colleagues have said from the, from the, the stage or what you hear from, from the floor. So two or three minutes from each on, on um, new ideas that have been stimulated by, by the debate. But who would like to open the discussion? We have a hand behind Tom. Hi. Um, so you said um, quality is not value for money. So how would you explain that to someone that, uh, let's say, an international student that comes to pay 17K to study for the quality of the degree and the experience? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Mm -hmm. So can I just repeat it? That yeah. I, th I think the question was um, for uh, it, how do you explain the notion that um, quality is not simply value for money when you are speaking to someone who has taken on very considerable debt to, to have the experience of higher education and to gain the qualification? Yeah, Hillary. that's a great question. I, I think it's without doubt that um, it's something that I will never stop sort of speaking about that international students pay far too much, let alone... I, I believe education should be free, so let's just get that out of the way. I believe education should be free. I don't believe that um, we should be letting people get into debt, no matter what kind of debt it is, in order to receive something that is for the public good. For international students, I think this is particularly important because I think the way that quality is advertised to international students is very different from their experience of when they come to, I can speak of a UK institution, I, I, don't, I can't speak for abroad. What I will say is that, you know, value for money could be qualified in some ways about around like the quality somebody would get out of their learning. But actually, if you really think about it, education should be a high quality at its basis. Right. And so when I'm speaking to an international student, the biggest thing that I say is that, you know, I don't think that, first of all, you should be paying as much as you do. But also, I don't think that you should be paying as much as you do to be told that you getting an education is how you like pound for pound that education is like value for money because quality is not just about how much you pay it's about what you get out of higher education you know i think lots of international students get out connections and networks that they wouldn't have gotten otherwise they get to explore opportunities that they wouldn't have gotten in other in other experiences and places and environments i think it's also important that education isn't about what you sit in the lecture theater to do Powerful, like you don't go to a lecture theatre and every word that your lecturer is saying, you're taking like one pound there, 20p there, 50p there, 70p there. That's, that's not the experience of education. You still have to go back and engage with that yourself. And I don't think there's a price on being able to be enriched by the value of what education gives you when you have a, a, good, a good and high quality environment, good and high quality teaching and learning, good and high quality um, outcomes that come out of what you come into education expecting to get rather than what people are telling you you're paying pound for pound on, you know. Um, and that's how I would explain why quality is not value for money, but quality is the value of quality in and of itself rather than being something that people should attach to um, value for money as this sort of, you know, receipt of, of you paying your 17k or 9.5k or however much it changes to per year to get your education and and that's what i would say on that mm. john um i would say that you will get the support that you need in order to succeed and i'll just say a little unpack that a little bit more in my own institution, we have three Scottish campus locations. Most of the students there don't pay fees, mm. of course. But we have a campus location, 4,000 students in the Middle East and one in Southeast Asia. And the students who study in the Middle East and in Southeast Asia pay fees in the usual way. Um, but um, the mindset they have and the place in which they work is not the same at all and um, while students travel around and exchange and learn from each other and see from each other's perspective what the quality of education is and what we have learnt from the fee-paying students and what's been driven up in our institution 
is our focus on the support, the academic and the other support that we put in place to enable the students, every student, to succeed on their course of study. And that's how I would explain it back. But to me, that's very interesting because I think it, it emphasises the obligation on universities to tailor their provision to the needs of individual students. And this is something I've mm -hmm. had to focus on in the past. You could provide precisely the same quality education, apparently precisely the same quality education, to do diff two different students who might come from different social and financial backgrounds. And they won't derive the same benefit if one measures that certainly in terms of future career progression or, or earning power. So it just, I think the points that you raised, John, emphasises the need for tailoring yeah. of, of a provision to individual students. But Chris, you wanted to come in. Yeah, so I, I mean, I'm a bit more phlegmatic about talking about value for money. I don't think we can avoid um, the fact that students invest um, in higher education, the taxpayer invests in higher education. I think it's important to recognise that students don't just invest money, they invest time. So this is a big chunk out of your life and you're making a lot of changes in your life to come to higher education. So we need to think about VFT as well as VFM. I think the really important thing is not viewing it in reductive terms. Yeah. So not viewing it just as a short term issue, not just viewing it as a financial issue, thinking holistically in the way that we've talked about here. But if you're able to do that, I don't think you can ignore the investment of money and time that various people are making in higher education. Thank you. I'd Any? just add from, I think it picks up on what John was saying about the wider support available within institutions. Um, I have to say, I think it's in it's incumbent on those of us who work in professional services sometimes, I think, to challenge, if you like, that paradigm of its students bringing in 17,000 per year per person and that's a, a profit margin mm -hmm. for the institution. I think it's really important to think, well, what can we do with that amount of money and turn that back into and invest in um, it's supporting the student experience, not just in the classroom or the laboratory or on placement etc but also in terms of the support services that you would need to access and that building of academic strong academic communities between and among students and um, between academic staff and students I have to say I'm pleased at Northumbria that this coming year our sabbatical officers are largely international students um, and that's been really remarkable for us and um, I think making their voices heard very loudly and strongly with us about how we are actually dedicating and turning that fee into something that they can actually see a wider benefit of. And if, all, if I'm perfectly honest, things that benefit the international student community benefit the whole student community. Um, it isn't necessarily a dichotomy. Mm -hmm. I suspect if Jamie Arrowsmith had been able to be here, he might, he might have made precisely that point. Thank you. Further questions? Yes, Alex. Thank you very much. <coughs> Uh, colleagues have, have spoken very well about the quality of the education rather than sort of getting dragged back into the processes, but I sort of can't resist sort of asking the, uh, the, the, uh, the obvious question around, we've, you've, you've spoken about the huge diversity of provision and providers and therefore uh, what quality might mean to them. We're seeing increasing divergence across the different nations within the UK. Is there still a single UK understanding of quality, and if not, does that matter? Thank you. So for those who missed that, the, uh, the question, Alex, as I understood it, is that bearing in mind the diversity of, of provision, um, certainly across the UK, but actually within each nation in terms of different types of, of institution, um, in, in view of that um, uh, diversity, is the search for, for a common mechanism of measuring quality and assessing quality, is that a, a false search? Who would like to? I, I can say something you want. Yeah, well, I think everyone has their mouths half open. <laughs> but, uh, Do you first or second? No, second. <laughs> okay. Just first. So, so I think the interesting thing about the UK is that uh, if you go to Scotland and Wales, people will talk about higher education as being part of the common good, and and you know something for everyone uh, in service to the nation. But they're both. For, for good or bad, wrapped up in a market that's the UK. So, so Wales, in particular, <coughs> recruits huge numbers of students from England. 
So even if you conceive of higher education in terms of the common good, you can't avoid the market monster of the UK. So I suspect the differences in the systems uh, may be less than the narrative at the political level. And there has been some, there was some interesting work done about six years ago looking at, you know, could you say that Wales and Scotland were more equitable than England? And you couldn't at that point. I don't know if anybody's updated that, but it'd be an interesting thing to do. I, having said all that, so, so, so I, I think we're probably more integrated because students move and staff move, and also we have a, a global UK identity. So for all those reasons, I do think the UK identity matters. I'm, I'm sure, sure that's true across, um, if you go not many miles offshore, you'll find that people are completely oblivious to the distinction between the four nations. Um, and Americans think that Edinburgh is part of England, don't they? So, uh, <laughs> Isn't it? Yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> point to John. Thanks, thanks for that, Simon. Um, <laughs> we do, of course, have a single UK code still. And the person on my right here spent a lot of time and work on that code, putting it to, uh, together. So that's still in place. The extent to which the different nations wish to refer to the code is a separate matter, isn't it? Um, I, I want, uh, and I would also say, Chris, yes, um, certainly for my own institution, other Scottish institutions, I think this is true, there are other Scots in the room here as well, when we are providing higher education in other parts of the world, it is UK HE that's being sold out, if, if you like. They don't get what Scottish HE is, unless I have a tartan tie and my kilt on or whatever it is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it is the UK brand that does uh, travel. And there is an issue for us in that. As the UK systems processes begin to pull apart from each other, what does UK brand stand for now? And, of course, this is linked to the processes that we have for review in the different parts of the UK as well. So there's a big issue there, which perhaps it wouldn't be safe to unpack just now, mm -hmm. Alex, but, yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Just happy to say um, thank you for that, uh, John. And I Pleasure. Knew you weren't going to say anything rude about it because I was sitting right next to you. So. <laughs> um, I've been part of a... a a research project which is emanating from Japanese institutions um, and they wanted to write about the um, the quality uh, landscape in the UK but almost everything we were writing I'd have to go in there and qualify it and say yes but not in England <laughs> um, and I think it's quite difficult to articulate it beyond the borders of our island quite frankly um, it's been difficult for a number of years now but it's becoming increasingly difficult. I remember speaking um, at a conference in Macau and colleagues asking me what, what's happened in English HE? What's gone wrong? Or even worse John, can you flick back to that side you told us before about Scottish HE? Um, which I'd clearly say no that I'm sorry but the blip has broken and I can't do that. Um, <laughs> but it, it is quite difficult to articulate what the differences are and why they're there in that sense um, and it was extremely difficult I think for those colleagues to, to write about it in a way that was succinct and made sense and yes I do think there is a real power and brand to UK higher education um, but it's being I have to say just increasingly difficult to articulate that because of the push and pull that we currently have. Thank you. Uh, let's move on. Um, we're not going to be able to cover as many questions as we would like, and there's, there's one, before we take that question, uh, hold it for a moment, I, I did want to uh, acknowledge that we've had several questions submitted um, from journalists, so I think are joining us online, and I want to make sure they don't think we're ignoring the questions. We won't, won't be able to cover all of them, but um, Vicky, without wishing to land you and your colleagues in too much trouble, I think it might be appropriate to um, reflect on these questions and perhaps uh, engage in discussion. But let me just pick out one which bears on um, a number of the points that we've discussed so far. And this is from David Kernahan at Wonky, who was who interested in the panel's view on peer review versus outcomes-based approaches to quality assessment. And of course, that gets back to the point of, of uh, personal engagement, uh, I think, with, with, with quality issues. Uh, but it's clearly a very fundamental question just say very briefly I think it works better when you try to find ways to combine them actually I think it's really I think 
having worked at QA for a number of years, and f forgive me, Vicky, <laughs> um, I've still got the fob for the car park, which you've reminded <laughs> me of. <laughs> I need a return. <laughs> um, I think it is, um, it's, it's, a, it's a challenge um, and I think what we see are almost competing philosophies at the moment but I do think there's a sweet spot somewhere in between. I think while I was working in review with QAA we'd gone too far away I think from considering outcomes as being important. It was largely about process uh, and process is important as, as I think John and others have outlined. Um, and I think the current regulatory framework takes us in a different direction. Somewhere in between, I think there is a sweet spot where you can really make that happen. And I think institutions try very hard to bridge those worlds. Um, and while you were still articulating and working with the quality code, you were able to say, well, what lifts me above, if you like, the minimum baseline? How do I aspire to that? Because I think that's really important in terms of quality. As John was saying, it's not just what is it now, it's what should it be, what could it be? Um, but I, I think that that would be a lovely, I think, vista to look out on as seeing a potential future direction. Mm -hmm. John? So I think, yes, we need to have both, of course, and um, I said that. But I also want to skewer this myth, I think, that's out there, that peer, that an outcomes focus is hard, is hard edged and there's rigour and, and uh, you know, it's the tough stuff there. And this peer review end of things, it's all light and we're all nice to each other and sit around the table and we hold hands. It's not true. It's not true. That was a special review. Oh, it was, it was. <laughs> <laughs> it's not true. And if any peer review um, process that you put in place lacks that edge, then it's failed. Mm -hmm. so, so I just think that's a myth that uh, one is hard-edged and one is soft. I think you need to have both of them to get the best out. And the risk, of course, as we were saying earlier, with, with an outcomes-based system, you may be measuring very um, rigorously a particular outcome which actually doesn't tell you directly anything about quality. Chris, tell me you Oh, no, I'm, I'm allowing for time. I was going to say, say two things. Yeah, of course... Um, you know, metrics, whether they're used in research or in education, need to be rounded by judgment. So I think there's a place for peer review as well as outcomes. I think it is worth saying about outcomes and the approach the OFS took that actually that was intended as a way of reflecting sector diversity. So if you read the regulatory framework, the idea was that we've got an incredibly diverse sector, 400 different providers, there will be many different ways of reaching good outcomes. So let's focus on outcomes and enable different ways of getting there. So I don't quite see outcomes so much in the territory of control as long as they're used properly and there's judgment around all of that. Thank you. Let's take the question at the back. I'm sorry, I can't see who it is, but please. Um, it's Smita, Simon. Oh, hi, Smita. <laughs> Um, yeah, I just wanted to uh, thank the panel for an, uh, just a fascinating discussion and ask them whether they think that there is enough um, understanding and scrutiny at leadership and strategic level within institutions of quality and whether that matters. Thank you. Very pertinent question. And I think um, to develop a point that I think John was making, I have to say that many heads of institution are very pleased if there is a, a quality specialist whom they can pass responsibility, <laughs> um, not exactly exercising leadership. John, do you want to develop that point? Um, I think there are a range of institutions led by a range of people. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> leaders are more engaged than um, others. For me, institutions at their best are led by people that absolutely get this stuff and don't see it as an additional burden, but work with it in order to enhance what they do. And if they can bear that in mind, then I think they won't go far wrong. We sat on the fence for a long time. <laughs> can, I, Hillary, please. can I just say on that as well, I think it's best done by people that know how to do it, but it's also best facilitated by institutions that bring people in to understand yes. what it is. And I think that's really crucial. Um, and I think about that, actually, because when I first became an officer, um, oh, God, am I going to get emotional? No, I won't. No, I'm fine. I'm leaving. It's fine. <laughs> um, I'll have a Prosecco in a moment. But um, 
you know. Said one already. No, I know, but I need to <laughs> choose the one and then I'll go home. But I, I think I think it's important that many students have a perception and an experience of quality, and then they like one day come into a space where they have to actively engage with how quality is done. And they don't know the acronyms, they don't know the words that they're using. People are talking about things that they've never seen, heard, experienced before, and they're expected to just roll with it. And sorry to everyone in Bristol, if you're watching, I'm so sorry, I blagged my way through most of those meetings because I did not know what anyone was talking about. Because the reality was, was that you're not, you're not taught this, you're, supposed to, you're expected to come into a space and just sort of know what's going on, know what people mean by quality and standards and just be like, yeah the student voice and that's not the reality of the, the depth that students can bring into those spaces and I, I really feel that it's best done by you know experts that are dedicated to this work and have experience but also it needs to be facilitated in an environment that's prepared to slow down sometimes and allow people to learn the processes understand what's what the stakes are of you know each stage and each part of what we do to maintain and assure and enhance quality I told you I love enhancing quality and really make sure that students can actively be a part of that rather than worrying about seeing something in a paper that looks like a red flag and then feel like they have to say something but not know what to say. Um, and so, mm. yeah, I think it's important that facilitating of the environment is embedded in there. Okay. Any further? Yeah, yeah, just to pick up on that student point, it's not going to work if you just pluck a student out, stick a student onto this group and mm. say, there, you're part, you're part of the whole thing. You have to support, you have yeah. to engage, you have to make sure that is built in too. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Lauren? I was just going to say briefly, I, I'm looking out into the audience and I know there are at least a couple of faces here who um, I worked with as student reviewers and made a huge difference mm. to the way... Um, quality was discussed and debated. I remember the very first um, review that in, in England that a student reviewer was part of the panel for, who actually stopped the proceedi proceedings and said, what the hell are you all talking about? <laughs> yeah, good. And it was actually a moment of clarity yeah, because good. I think other people around that table were really rather glad that somebody had had the, yeah. the foresight to bring it up. And I think we were often accused in, in days of yore of developing Kwahili, a, a language that we understood <laughs> Um, you, you had to be in it to win it. Um, mm. But there's a similar danger, I would say, with the language around metrics and data literacy. Mm. Just because it's numbers, it doesn't mean it's any clearer. Mm -hmm. um, and I still think there's, some, there's room for that discussion and debate. And I think the point you made, Hilary, about bringing others in is really important to actually enriching that discussion and knocking down those barriers around language mm. um, which are often just thrown up in order to mystify folks. Mm. Thank you. We'll take a final question at the back there and then to remind the panel I'm going to ask mm. each of you to make any final points of, of learning from this session if you like. But please. Right. Thank you. Uh, I think seven years ago QAA had the pleasure of hosting the European Quality Assurance Forum just around the corner um, and it was a uh, and I just wanted to look to, to the European space for a moment and, and pull out a term that I, I hear more there than I hear in the UK, and it's quality culture, or culture of quality. And I worry that increasingly uh, talk of quality and quality assurance is mechanistic and we lose sight of people and bringing people with us. And certainly leading in my institution at Warwick, we, we're really challenged at the moment to get past the process that is largely responsive to the external regulatory regime and to get back to bringing people to, um, to be enthused and excited about what it means to deliver high quality, and that's staff and students. And, and I'm glad Maury made the point. As a, as a retired student reviewer, um, I'm proud of the, the change in narrative that students brought to the quality scene for, for quite a while there, and QAA led that and, and was central to that. Um, and I feel like increasingly we're, we're drifting away from talking about people, from talking about culture. And I, I wondered if we could round off by, by bringing it back to people and, and asking for, for the panel's thoughts on how do we fill that void going forward in, in the current context? So, so to summarise, I, th I think you're emphasising the importance of, of culture and, and I think by implication the saying that process is not important unless it helps develop the, the, the right culture. How, perhaps each of you reflect on how, how close are we to being able to say in individual institutions that a real cultural quality exists. Yeah, I don't know who wants Hillary, to do you want to start? I don't know why I volunteered myself like that. I have no thoughts, just vibes. No, um, <laughs> I, I have actual. No, I, I think that's an excellent way to round off. Actually, I think we 
there are so many processes in quality and I think that's okay. I think it's okay to be robust and to be thorough and to have a way about going about quality. That's how it's maintained, that's how it's assured and that's how we can open up room for it to be enhanced. And, and that's at the heart of why we need to continue to concentrate on quality. What I will say is that it does come back to this definition, right? It comes back to how are we speaking to people about it? How are we inviting people in without jading them with acronyms and, and lots of different things that they don't understand, nor are they really involved in properly? And so what it means for me to bring it back to people is actively giving students, and I'll speak for students in my two days left, um, actively giving students the ability to speak about quality on their terms, stop pigeon pigeonholing them into talking about things that they don't, have a, nat a natural affinity to let them speak about it on their terms, contribute on their terms and give the insight that they so richly have to bring in the work that we need to continue to do to make sure that quality remains high, right? And I think there's something really important about making sure that when we do this work and when we listen to students, it's not about just round tables and like periodic like feedback sessions is about constantly trying to be on the ground and really understand the culture around it understand how students are feeling understanding what students are experiencing and how that's linking back to their experience of education in its fullness and and that's what it means to bring back quality to people it's not you know it's great to have the processes but the people need to feel the impact and and feel the change and the the experience of what high quality looks like for it to be meaningful to them in their experience Thank you. I, in, in view of the time, I'm going to suggest that each of you now, certainly yeah. the other three, Hilary, uh, <laughs> uh, um, yeah. reflect on, on this achievement of a, of a, uh, a culture of quality mm. and also in the process perhaps answer my question about what you've learnt in this session which enables you to be optimistic or pessimistic about the development of a, uh, a culture of, of quality. Who? Can you go very on? Shall I start off first? Um, my reflection on the basis of the question there is I think you're off to in flying start if you have an enhancement-based mm -hmm. system in place. Why? Because staff and students want to engage in that space. Why? Because they come into the job, they study because they want to make things better. They want to enhance, they want to look for ways in which that can be done. If your system is set up in such a way that you just have to clear this um, hurdle, that's going to be a tough gig to try and, I guess, enthuse people. If you have an enhancement focus with edge in the system, with the right challenge, then I think you're off to a good start in terms of engaging people and building the enhancement-based culture within the institution. And if I could just bang on a little bit more about my own institution, we have a enhancement culture at the Scottish campus locations and five or six years ago, we had a compliance culture in the Middle East and in the Southeast Asian. And we have sought over the last five to six years to take the enhancement view out. And that has worked for an enhancement-led institutional review have, has said to us that has worked. So it can be uh, done. Any further lessons from the discussion? The, the market, you know, uh, story is very, very strong in this part of the UK. And um, yeah, that's just come through loud and mm. clear. Mm. Thank you. Maureen. Um, I was just going to say, I thought there'd been, uh, I suppose, a surprising amount of synergy of our views, actually, despite the fact we're coming from um, different perspectives. I think we have to recognise um, in England, um, and I think we have to acknowledge the elephant in the room we can talk to one another within our institutions and we can talk to one another through networks and um, through mission groups through special interest groups etc but we do need to engage the regulator in the conversation and it's very difficult working with a regulator who we know we're not your friend um, QAA was never your friend <laughs> but there was that sense of they need to be part of that conversation um, and we need to engage with them and similarly they need to engage with us as well if we want to have that discussion about developing a culture it isn't somebody does something to somebody um, and you either fall or stand by it um, or you're penalized or you're not I think there needs to be a an encouragement I think to bring that wider discussion into the fore if we possibly can thank you key point Chris 
So, I mean, I've, I've just come into a university from the regulator, and um, I would say when I arrived, it was just the last uh, kind of bout of COVID, and it's difficult to have a dialogue about anything or, or generate a culture of anything in that environment because everything was so structured and offline. But, but as the universities opened up, I've certainly been pretty impressed by the way in which they're trying to generate a dialogue with students. And perhaps the next challenge is making it about more than something that's structured to something that's informal. And, and I, you know, John used the phrase continuing ongoing dialogue, and that seems to me the really key thing. It's key within universities, but it's also key in terms of that crucial relationship between universities, the government, and students. We've got to get that dialogue going, because that's, that's the only way you can capture the complexity of the kaleidoscope that Hillary talked about at the start. Hilary, final thought from you? Students win. The students end. Win. <laughs> no, no. Um, yeah, but yeah. on a more serious note, I, I think yeah, we still, like, quality is a journey. That's the reality of it. It's not about coming to one place and ending there. And that's probably where I've got to in this, in this debate that, you know, we're not trying to get to this single finishing point and then sort of drop our, like, take off our gloves and go home and sleep. We're trying to continue this process that we can continue to, like, pass down to people to develop and grow and nurture. And we have to do that collaboratively, even if we disagree. I'm fine with disagreeing, but we need to have a culture where we can disagree in order to grow. And, and that could be facilitated in ways that are more powerful and more meaningful than we think. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I, I, I won't attempt to summarise the discussion except perhaps to say that what we've heard, I think, emphasises the subtlety of some of the um, arguments and, and, and the perspectives, uh, arguments in the sense of discussion. Um, that the, that is a, this is a complex field, um, but it merits uh, a great deal more discussion. Uh, that enhancement implies, of course, continuing discussion and continuing aspirations to improvement. We've also learned that it can be a somewhat daunting field for people such as students coming into it anew and trying to understand the language of, of culture. Does that mean we're closer to meeting my encouragement that we should, in addition to understanding the subtleties of this subject, we should get closer to the ability to describe in concise terms what we mean by quality to people outside the condescenti, not least in, in government? Are we closer to that? I don't know. I think it's a a work in progress, but I would suggest that we need to retain that, that focus. We've had a great debate. Would you please join with me in thanking Maureen, John, Chris and Hilary. And I believe more Prosecco awaits. Okay. <laughs> please. Good. Oh, lovely. Yes. Good. Yeah, well done. Great win for my last Remember one. Remember to take your...